Hi, it's Zora here from the Wizard's Code. In this video, we're going to do a quick tour of the making of a game called Phantasmabob. This is an entry into the Messy Coders Halloween Game Jam. Like all game jams, it's pretty rough around the edges, but we set out with specific objectives and we did get there. So, here's what my jam partners, Yolan, the Messy Coder and I did. The theme was horror, so we quickly settled on a dungeon with zombies. The lore of the dungeon is built on the fascination folks in the Messy Coder Discord channel have with Bob Ross. It turns out that in this alternative universe, Bob Ross had an evil twin. In the womb, the twin tried to kill Bob, but only succeeded in sucking out all the negative energy. This explains why Bob Ross is so loved, but what of his evil twin? Well, it seems that 2020 is the year of Devil Bob. And you, as the player, need to stop him by entering his lair. Our plan for the game was for it to be a multiplayer roguelike with procedural dungeons, permadeath and endless play. However, the twist was that if any player in the team was killed, then all players would be ejected from the dungeon and the game was over. There would be pickups throughout the dungeon and these could be donated to other players. So the idea was that you'd have to give all of the best pickups and the best weapons to the weakest players in order to keep them alive. Players would also have to act as a team and protect the weakest players or those needing to regenerate so that they could survive. So here you can see what we ended up with. Along the way in two or three videos I'll highlight how we did it, what assets we used and any tricks that we learned along the way. So let's take a look. Okay, day one, October 16. This meant we needed to create a dungeon. I've recently been working a lot with Dungeon Architect. See my previous videos for more information about that, but using Dungeon Architect, I threw together an initial dungeon using one of the default demo themes. It was pretty ugly, but it was functional. With a little tweaking, I added some prick-up prototypes and it mapped more closely to our need. We'd worry about atmosphere and textures and things like that later on. Another key component right at the start was the player controller. For our team, game jams are all about learning new things and testing out new ideas. Since Yolan has recently been working with an open source, or rather building an open source, third person controller, this was what he wanted to focus on. He wanted to fine tune it in a real game. So he threw it into our currently empty project, and you can see the test scene here. Day two arrived as quickly as any other day. And this was all about integration. While Yolun continued to work on the player controller, I focused on bringing it into the game itself. Here you can see a default Uma running around our lovely candy dungeon. I also spent some time tweaking the dungeon generation theme, but you can't really see that here. It was just to make it a little bit more suitable for our style of game. By day three, I was already bored of running around a dungeon with nothing to do. Yolan was busy working on the combat animations in the controller, but we had nothing to fight. So I turned my focus on introducing some test enemies. As always, the goal is to get going as quickly as possible and then to improve. So I quickly knocked together some enemies using Emerald AI. As I've said before, Emerald AI is a fantastic asset for getting going quickly, but I do find it really limiting in the long run. For a game jam though, the speed of getting started is great. So I imported Emerald AI and configured some of the example enemies that come with it as our first prototype enemies in the game. This required me to do something that I'd never done with Dungeon Architect before, and that was enable runtime nevmash generation. This turned out to be really simple once I'd learned not to read the outdated documentation and instead look at the demo scenes included in the asset. By the end of this day, day three, we had enemies that attacked the player, but we couldn't fight back yet. We also had health and weapon pickups appearing in the dungeon. These were from the Cinti prototype pack, but they weren't doing anything yet, so I wanted to get started on them. One of the things I've learned in earlier team game jams is the importance of having a way of sharing work. Version control is really useful, but it's not great for some parts of Unity projects, such as prefabs and scenes, since they're not human readable, and so resolving conflicts is a nightmare. I'm sure there's a lot more I can learn about how to do this, but one of the things I've found to be really helpful is to have separate dev scenes for each of the major parts of the game. This means that team members are working in different places at different times, so there are fewer conflicts. So on day three, I created our first dev scene. You can see it here, the pickup scene. Here we've got the prototype health pickup and two different sized treasure chests. I also created a simple UI, but I ran out of time to wire it up. It was time for bed, so I'd be ready for work the next day. 
Day four of my game jam started after a full day of work and spending some time with the family in the evening. Then I got started on the pickup system. This meant I needed to build an inventory. This was an area I was looking forward to experimenting with. I'd be needing one in my main game soon, and so this was a chance to do some early prototyping. I pulled in some public domain icons from opengameart.org, as I wasn't sure which icon packs the whole team had, and I got to work on enabling the treasure chests and health pickups. I quickly got the system working, the health pickups went into the inventory quick slots in the upper left and could be used with the press of a 1, 2 or 3 key. The treasure went into the coins bag in the upper right and acted as the player's score. The biggest challenge in all this was learning the new Unity input system. The documentation on this is still pretty sparse and most of the tutorials I found are fairly incomplete in some way, but I managed to piece it together and make it all work in the end. Overall, I'm impressed with the new input system. It does feel much, much better than the old system, so I'm really pleased that I spent the time learning that. Days 5, 6 and 7 were tough days at work for me and I ended up getting very little done on the game. For me this was just a time of consolidation and technical debt pay down. Yulan however dropped a big update to the controller. This was mostly core features that would be important to the combat system later on but there was also loads of tweaks to the kobold animations that we were using. Day 7 was notable in that the messy coder dropped our initial multiplayer lobby using Mirror. It wasn't integrated into our game yet, but it was a good start. We were on our way to being a true multiplayer game. To test this, we used a great little tool that Yolan made, which made it easy to create a clone of your project using Simlinks, and then run two versions of Unity at the same time. This made it so much easier to test the multiplayer stuff. Yolan also added a weapon item type to the inventory system, along with our first weapon and a simple UI for it. This was placed into the pickup dev scene, and the character could now go and pick up a sword, but he wasn't yet able to wield it. Day 8, October 22nd. Yolan added more flexibility into the inventory system, allowing different slots, such as quick slots, backpacks, weapon slots, and much more. This meant that when the player picked up the sword, it would now be stored in an appropriate place. For example, here it's attached as if there were a scabbard. However, we're still not able to draw the sword. Meanwhile, I spent the evening replacing the sample dungeon assets with Infinity PBR's dungeon kit. This is a great asset with loads of flexibility, but it, it is getting a bit old now. The good news is the publisher is working on an update which will immediately upgrade the graphics in our game. The asset comes with loads of models to build your own style of dungeon. Its highly flexible substance-based material system allows you to change the look of the, fin of the dungeon as well. I didn't spend time adjusting the textures though, this is a game jam, not enough time for that. But I did build a few composite prefabs to add a little variety. I think you'll agree, it looks quite a bit better than the original prototype models. Day 9. Thank goodness it's Friday. Whilst it was still a work day for our team, we were getting ready for the weekend. Our Friday evening work focused mainly on preparing for the weekend sprint. By a stroke of luck, the Infinity PBR Humble Bundle coincided with the start of this jam. We were all fans of Infinity PBR models, but to get so many of them at such a cheap price in a Humble Bundle, we all picked it up. What that meant was that we quickly strayed from the idea of a dungeon filled with zombies to a dungeon filled with zombies and fantasy creatures. By the end of Friday evening, I'd wired up the mimics and Devil Bob himself had put in an appearance. At this point, we were ready to start truly testing the multiplayer options. One thing we've learned from previous jams is that if you leave the multiplayer work too late, it can be really difficult to catch up again. And we were starting to add real game characters. So Yolan wired up the controller to be mirror enabled, and we started to think about how do we enable the characters and the dungeon build. Day 10, Saturday. No work to get in the way. Of course, there is family time, but still, no work and plenty of time to play. Unfortunately though, we heard that our third member, the Messy Coder, had some personal issues come up which meant he wasn't going to be able to focus on the jam anywhere near as much as he'd hoped. Therefore we lost, hopefully temporarily, our network team member. Yolan stepped in to integrate the lobby code and wired up the multiplayer enabled player controller. Since we weren't going to get multiplayer working soon, I quickly created some AI companions for the player using Emerald AI and Infinity PBR Human Pack. This meant we could move forwards with the core mechanic of supporting and protecting teammates 
without actually having real players in there. This would be okay, but without the other player screaming in your ear, I NEED HEALTH! It just didn't have the dynamic we hoped for, but it did let us proceed. I also wired up another of the Infinity PBR assets, a mushroom. As can be seen here, the companions and the AI will now fight, but there's many issues to resolve. Broken animations, missing weapons, and the combat just feels pretty sluggish. But the new dungeon was already starting to annoy me. It was boring to look at. It was no longer the horrible candy theme we started with, but it was still pretty dull. I quickly rediscovered just how much difference you can make simply by adding torches and braziers to create variations in light and shadow. Our companions were now able to attack enemies and the enemies would fight back. This was where part of our gameplay loop needed to come into play. Remember that Devil Bob wins if any player in the team is killed. Therefore his minions should probably attack the weakest player. Unfortunately, out of the box, Emerald AI does not support this kind of feature. It'll always prioritise either the nearest enemy, the first detected enemy, or a random enemy, depending on how you configure it. After a quick dive into the Emerald AI API, I discovered that I could override which enemy the AI was targeting. So I wrote an AI director that would track which player was the weakest and force all the enemy AIs that were in combat to target that character. In this initial version, the enemies would simply attack the player with the lowest health, but later I planned to roll in armor and weapons calculations too. But even this simplistic approach resulted in what we wanted. All the enemies now attacked the same companion. Perfect. We were about to enter our 12th day. We were just working a few hours a day each. The game environment was now starting to come together, but we still couldn't actually fight any of the enemies. In all honesty, I started to doubt whether it was a good idea to have used Yolan's fledgling controller. Our player couldn't even wield a sword, let alone attack. They also never died. They just stood there and absorbed damage from the AIs. But I've worked with Yolan before, so I held my faith, choosing instead to tease him about how we could change the lore to have the player character be a coward who never fought, but followed the companions around throwing health packs at them. But, as you can see from this playthrough of the submitted game, my faith was rewarded. In the next video, we'll look at how that happened and introduce you to the open source controller that Yolan has built.